my only job as MC is to vamp if someone's having trouble uh, getting their computer connected. So I don't want to take any time at all uh, on that role because I think people are here to, uh, to get the content uh, and get the real people. Um, I will try to say insulting things about people while they're getting set up, though. So just to get started, uh, this is Stuart Sierra. He is not the tallest Stuart in the closure community. Uh, he's capable of writing a closure book, but not without help from someone else. Uh, and I'll let him take it from there. Thanks, Stuart. And are you going to take, oh, you have one. I have I'll, one. I'll keep this. I can actually just interject additional insults and comments. Yes, yes. So I have a mic. Is it on? All right. Fantastic. First try. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Closure Conj number two. So you're here at the Conj in Raleigh. I'm going to assume that you have read all the closure books out there that you have done every exercise on foreclosure, you have a million points on Stack Overflow, you spend 12 hours a day on IRC, you might even have dyed your hair blue. <laughs> and after all that, you've hit a brick wall. You're wondering, what's next? What is the next cool thing I can do or learn about or experiment with enclosure that's gonna melt my brain, blow my mind, and just make me fall in love with it all over again? And I have no idea. But I'm going to try to give you, in this talk, uh, some ideas for new things to explore, things you can try out, and areas of closure you might be familiar with, might not be familiar with, new things that you can check out. And with each section, uh, a handful of project ideas for things you might want to try, work on, talk about. I don't have any context or background on these other than suggesting them. So these are just ideas for you to take as a starting off point. Number one, the reader. The reader is what makes a lisp a lisp, the fact that we have a reader and a printer. So you probably know that the reader and the printer together can form a, a simple serialization protocol. You can take any data structure and print it to a string, save it on disk somewhere, and then read it back. You probably also know that there are two printer functions in Clojure, the PR function, which prints things for consumption by the reader, consumption by a computer, and the print function, which prints things for human consumption later. In fact, they're both the same. They both have the same mechanics underneath. The only difference is the per function binds print readably to true. When print readably is true, then you get stuff printed that when read back will be equal to the thing that you printed. So print prints things with no guarantee that you'll be able to read the thing back. PR prints things guaranteeing that the thing you print when you read it back will be equal to the thing you printed. But it will only be equal. It will not be identical. It might be a slightly different type. For instance, that map there could be read in as an array map or a hash map. If this other special var, print dupe, is true, then you are guaranteed you will get exactly the same type back that you printed. Now, in order to make this work, there's a little trick in the reader, the hash equals reader macro. This is the secret back door into the closure reader. Anytime the reader encounters this, it will evaluate the expression inside, actually compile it and evaluate it, and insert the return value into the stream of what it's reading. So it's a back door. Here I've evaluated an expression, and that becomes part of the thing that was read. Now, of course, there may be situations where you want to read a piece of closure source from a, trust, a source that you don't necessarily trust, or a source that you don't know if it's correct. So in that case, use read eval to make sure that the reader will not obey the hash equals reader macro. That ensures that reading is safe and free of side effects. So these are the three basic vars that control how the reader and the printer works. And notice you do have to choose. You can use print dupe 
to get the exact same type with the exact same metadata before and after reading and printing something. Or you can have read eval set true or set false to ensure that reading is safe. You can't have it both ways. The other thing you can do with the printer is extend it to new types. In Clojure, in Clojure core, core print, you will find these two methods, print method and print dupe. They're very similar. They both dispatch on the type of an object. And print method is called for normal printing, print and PR. Print dupe is called when print dupe is true. Frequently, they will be exactly the same. So if you look in Clojure source code at core underscore print, you will find lots and lots of these method definitions for lots of different types, including a bunch of prefer method declarations to ensure that even if something implements two interfaces, as most things in Clojure do, that you can actually print it as you want it to be printed. So you can add these methods for your own types, other Java classes, things you want to be able to print and read back. So where this gets interesting, is when you can use the reader in your program as a way to load data without actually evaluating it as code. And one good way to do that is with resources. Java has a concept of resource files packaged along with your source code that are not compiled. They are not code. If you're using Maven, they go in one set of directories. Using Linegan, they go in a different directory. But the end result is they will be added into the jar file or the war file or whatever the target object your build is producing. Then there's a function, enclosure, enclosure Java IO called resource, that given the path to any resource on your class path can return a URL to that file. The interesting thing about the Java jar format, although it's not the most efficient compression format, it does have this ability to address any file inside the jar with random access. So once you have that resource URL, then you can open it with the reader function and get a reader stream to read the text from that file. Then you can wrap that in one extra thing, a Java IO pushback reader. This is a requirement in order to pass it to Clojure's read function. Read expects a pushback reader. IO reader returns a buffered reader. Turns out you can't have something that implements both, so you just have to wrap it in a pushback reader in order to read it. Once you do that, you can read and get the forms from that file without evaluating them. So here I opened core.clj as a resource and read the first form from it, which, not surprisingly, is a namespace declaration. As an example of this, I used this technique in the tool that I made to help set up configuration for continuous integration test jobs on Clojure's build server. So this is a simple project. It's on GitHub. And the first thing it does when it is run is load a resource file called CI data. And inside CI data, I just have a big map of input to this program that I wrote. It's in one map so that I can read it with a single call to read. It's a single data structure. And then I have some comments explaining what it is. I have a list of versions and JDKs to test, and a list of all the different Clojure contrib libraries in the new contrib layout, including their owners, people who have permission to run the builds and releases in Hudson. So I could have put all of this data in the code. I could have had just a big global var somewhere that had this data structure in it. But I like the conceptual separation that this gives. This says this is input to my program. This is not part of the code of my program. I also have one advantage that this is not going to be evaluated. It's only going to be read. So here where I used strings for the usernames, I could have just as easily used closure symbols. They're not going to throw any errors because they're not being evaluated as anything. Now one popular way to deal with this kind of uh, input data or saving data as a string is to use JSON. But JSON is a vastly inferior serialization format compared to closure data structures. I mean, it's very, very limited. JSON is certainly not going away. It is the base language of web interfaces. But 
when you have the option of using closure data, it's a much richer set of types that you can work with and define your data with. So here are some ideas, things you can play with. You can write your own reader. It's not hard. There is an example in ClojureScript of a reader written in Clojure. And you can then change the behavior of that reader to do something different. Someone asked on the mailing list a few weeks ago, can I, trigger, can I set a flag in the reader to make it read big decimals instead of doubles when I have a floating point number? And the answer was no, the reader doesn't support that. But you could make your own reader that does do that and then use it to read in your input data for your program. You could uh, play with reader macros if you're into that sort of thing. The other thing you can do is make readers and printers for other data formats. For example, the JSON library that I maintain for Clojure follows the same API structure as the reader and the printer. So when you can represent any other data source as just data to be read in and data to be printed out, lots of programs get much easier. Everything is just closure data, and all you're doing is transforming it to one kind of text format or another. Now, the one thing I forgot to bring with me was a water bottle. Excuse me. <laughs> Step two, extending interfaces, extending Clojure the language itself. Clojure is a language built on interfaces. If you look at the Clojure source code, you will find all of these and more written in Java, the interfaces that are the foundation of the language. And all of Clojure's built-in functions, things like conj, asos, merge, they're all implemented in terms of these interfaces. So if you want to write your own data type, your own data structure that supports Clojure's built-in data manipulation functions, you have to implement these interfaces. The hard part is figuring out which ones. So for example, if we take the class of a vector and call ancestors on it, we get this huge set of interfaces and classes that are the super classes of persistent vector. So this is a little hard to read. So I threw together a couple of uh, small functions to help this out. Don't worry about the details of what this does. Basically, it finds all of the superclasses of a given class and then does some looping around to print them in a nice tree structure like this. So here's another example. This is the inheritance tree of persistent array map. I've highlighted the concrete classes in blue and the interfaces in brown. So if you want to write your own data structure that behaves like a map, these are all the interfaces you have to implement. You don't have to worry about the actual concrete classes, just the interfaces. So going from there, you can figure out how to implement these interfaces by looking at the functions you want to support. So if we start with, for example, the asos function, this is one of the core data manipulation functions in Clojure, and we look at the source code to it, we see essentially in the base case, a single key and a value, this is calling a method in the Clojure Lang RT class. It is calling RT asos. Turns out a lot of the core methods in Clojure are actually implemented in this RT class in Java because they're part of the bootstrapping for the language. RT stands for runtime, by the way. So if we go and look at rt.java, we can find the asos method and see how it works. We find, OK, it does some initial checking to see if the collection is null. And then if it's not, then it's just going to cast to the associative interface and call the asos method of that. So that's the third layer of indirection. We started with the closure asos function, that called the RT asos method, and that is calling the asos method of the associative interface. So then we go look at the associative interface and we can see how asos has to work for data structures. We can see that something that is associative also has to support I persistent collection and I lookup. So it has to support all those other methods in order to properly support asos. But the asos method itself is pretty basic. It takes a key and a value, 
and returns a new associative thing. So as an example of doing this, a long time ago, in fact, before the def type, def protocol syntax had been finalized, I wrote some code to do tuples. Tuples are fixed size vectors. They behave exactly like vectors in every way, but they only have a set number of elements represented as fields in a Java class. As a result, they can be, in some situations, more efficient than working with lots of small vectors. Now, the, again, the actual syntax for this won't work anymore because the syntax has changed. But if anyone wants to dig up this code and fix it to work with the new def type syntax, it would be a fun, interesting little exercise. The important thing is that tuples, in this case, behave exactly like vectors. There is no difference between the behavior of vectors and tuples. So if you want to write your own data structure that implements the built-in functions, you want to make sure that it has exactly the same behavior in every case. If it's not doing the same thing as the built-in data structures, then it's not really fulfilling the contract that those interfaces imply. So when you're looking at implementing your own data structures, make sure that you're not just reusing the name of a built-in function. You might want to do that, but then you're creating your own function with its own unique semantics for your data structure. The idea with making your own data structures that implement all of the built-in interfaces is that you can provide a data structure that is a drop-in replacement for one of the built-in data structures, where the only difference is perhaps some different performance characteristics that make it a better choice in certain situations. Part three, closure makes concurrency easy. So I want to make it hard again. Actually, closure has lots of great uh, features, different data structures and types for dealing with concurrency, but it's not the complete story. There are a huge uh, number of things, most of them under the Java util concurrent package that are really useful for dealing with concurrency and offer you even more options for how to design concurrent programs. One of the most common ones that you'll run into is executors. This is the basis for the thread pools that Clojure maintains for agents and futures. But you can create your own executors that have different characteristics, different ways of allocating threads. One of the most useful, I think, is the scheduled thread pool. This allows you to uh, create a pool and then submit functions for it to run, either repeatedly, at a specific time, on a schedule, anything like that. This is where it becomes especially convenient that all closure functions implement the Java util concurrent callable interface. So you can just pass a closure function directly to an executor, and it will know what to do with it. The atomic references are part of a whole set of atomic types that Java Util Concurrent provides. The atomic reference in particular is the foundation for Clojure's atom. An atomic reference just says, okay, you have a pointer to something, and in a single operation, you can atomically compare and set that value to a new pointer. You can change it to something. So the implementation of atom is basically a wrapper around atomic reference that adds this loop. It adds this spin loop that says, if I wasn't able to update the atomic reference once, I'm going to try again immediately. That's what closure atoms do. But there are more specific types of atomic classes in Java Util Concurrent. In particular, the atomic long, which represents just a atomically updatable integer value. So you can use an atomic long equivalently to using a closure atom with a number inside it. The difference is, and the JDK documentation is a little vague on this point, but they suggest that atomic long, where possible, will compile down to machine instructions. Lots of modern processors, because we have to deal with atomically updating counters all the time, lots of modern CPUs have an actual instruction to atomically update 
an integer somewhere in memory. And again, the JDK won't promise anything, but they say if your platform supports that, they will try to compile these atomic long operations down to those special machine instructions. And if you run an example like this for several million iterations, you will eventually see a small but measurable performance difference between these two. Next is the countdown latch. This is a thread synchronization mechanism. This is the basis for closures promises. A countdown latch basically says maybe several threads are doing something, but then they all have to wait for some other process to complete. You initialize a countdown latch with a number, and then from some thread you call countdown to decrement that number. When it gets to zero, all of the threads that have called await on that latch are allowed to move forward. So you can pause any number of threads in your program and have them wait on something else with a countdown latch. So a closure promise is basically a combination of an atom and a latch. That's how it works. There are lots more things in Java Util Concurrent, some of them uh, far more esoteric than I can even come up with examples for. Cyclic barrier is another kind of latch mechanism. Semaphore is a way to signal uh, occupation of resources by certain threads. Uh, exchanger, I don't even know what that one does. Um, then there are the concurrent collections. And these are really interesting. So, Java has its built-in collection types, list, map, set, and so on. And then it has utilities that will return synchronized versions of those collections, synchronized map, synchronized set, and so forth. But the synchronized versions all work by having a single exclusion lock. The synchronized collections say only one thread can be using this collection at any one time. So if you have lots of threads trying to read or update that collection, there's going to be a lot of contention for that one resource. The concurrent collections promise that they can be used safely from multiple threads, but there is no single lock controlling access. So a concurrent map, queue, or list can be read and modified simultaneously from multiple threads, and those threads will not interfere with each other. So this is a different kind of mutable collection from what Clojure's mutable reference types give you. A Clojure ref or atom basically says there can be one change at a time and any number of readers to that collection at once. The concurrent collections are mutable, but they are also thread safe. These might be interesting for uh, a shared cache, some piece of mutable state that you need to keep track of from multiple threads where you don't need the strict concurrency semantics of refs or atoms. Similarly, the blocking queues. These sort of go in the other direction. These are data structures that you can use as synchronization mechanisms. You can enforce different characteristics depending on which type you choose as to when a thread has to wait. Maybe it has to wait to put something into the queue. Maybe it will wait to take something out of the queue. These are, again, shared, mutable, thread-safe data structures. You could use them for work queuing. You could use them for passing messages between threads. Lots of possibilities with these queues. Finally, at the bottom, you do have access to Java locks, and there are situations where you might want to use explicit locking. The locking macro is basically the same as Java's synchronized keyword with a little extra insurance that the lock gets released. So putting anything inside a locking block ensures that only one thread can be inside the lock occupied by that code at any given time. Only one piece of code can mess with that object that you are locking on. There are also more uh, elaborate kinds of locks in the Java Util Concurrent Locks package. Read-write locks, re-entrant locks, other more uh, elaborate locking mechanisms that may be useful in some applications. Then there's volatile. Volatile is probably the least understood feature of the JVM. 
Uh, Brian Getz, who wrote uh, Java Concurrency in Practice, also wrote an entire article online about how to deal with volatile fields and how to use them correctly. Basically, a volatile guarantees exactly one thing. It guarantees that if you write to a volatile field from one thread, that value is immediately visible on any other thread that looks at the volatile variable. It won't be using an old value from the cache. However, it does not guarantee any kind of atomicity of update operations. So anytime you're doing a calculation where the new value depends on reading the old value, volatile doesn't work. It will not give you enough guarantees. It's only good when you are writing a new value and you don't care what the previous value was. But there are still situations where this turns out to be useful. Uh, for example, sending a, a flag to update a process that is already running. Or maybe recording the last value of some state of something where the previous value doesn't matter and you don't care if it gets overridden. This doesn't get used a lot, but it's a useful trick to know about because it can be faster than using locks or atomic references. Finally, there is the unsynchronized field type. This gives you no guarantees whatsoever. It is a mutable field which could be totally different in different threads, and you have no way of telling when it's going to get updated. It's kind of funny that Clojure makes you go to a lot of work to get an unsynchronized mutable field in a type. In Java, it's the default. So it's lots of fun to play around with this stuff. It is also very hard. For the last year, I've been working on uh, a personal side project, just a fun experiment that I called Click, which was an attempt to make a new concurrency primitive, something I called a notifier. That's a little bit like a promise. It receives a value, and then you can deref it to get the value out. The difference is it also supports callbacks. So when a value becomes available, it will invoke the chain of callbacks that were waiting for that value. This is, as I said, an experiment. I don't suggest you use it, especially because I found a bug just yesterday. So this kind of stuff is very, very hard. But I mean, you can spend hours trying to wrap your brain about the exact semantics of what's going on when you mess around with these raw concurrency bits and pieces. So here are some things to try. Ref history is actually a feature of closure. That is a feature of the multi-version concurrency control that controls how many old copies of a ref we keep around. This has some performance implications when lots of threads are trying to read the same ref and there's a lot of contention. Uh, it's not very well documented or well explored, but it's an interesting thing to explore and experiment with. Uh, Christoph Grand, who's here, wrote an interesting article about the problem of partial locks, how to have a reference to part of a data structure and modify it without having to lock the entire data structure or encapsulate the entire data structure in a transaction. There's always interesting active research in distributed locks and transactions. This is another very hard problem. It's been uh, thwarting computer scientists for years, and there's some very technical papers about how to do it. Um, but it's a definite need. People often want the ability to do this thing in a distributed way. And so there's, I know, some active work going on there in the closure community that's really interesting. And then maybe just exploring other ways to deal with concurrency, different primitives with different semantics. Closure has var, atom, ref, and agent. Maybe that's enough, but there probably is room for more, more types that have different semantics for different specific applications. Finally, a few things outside of Clojure, out of the uh, language itself that you might find interesting to explore. The first is Clojure Test Generative, written by Stu Holloway on the floor over there. Closure test generative. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's true. He, he didn't write it just now. He actually wrote it a year ago and didn't tell anybody. But uh, it's on GitHub. You can find it. And so this is the, the semi-official announcement. Closure test generative 
is built on top of closure.test. So it uses the same mechanisms for finding and running tests. But what it gives you is a way to write a test function here called a spec and specify what the inputs to that function should look like. So in this case, it's a custom integer function that returns integers in a particular range. Then you tell test generative how long you want the test to run and how many CPU cores you have. And it will start generating random input data to feed to your function and generate as many as it can in the time that you've given it and run your assertion function for each of them. So this is a different style of testing from unit testing. It does take some getting used to, but it means you can cover far more test inputs to your function than you could if you were writing all of them out by hand. It basically allows you to make assertions about universal properties or invariants about your code and then try to verify that they're correct. If test generative finds an input that causes your test to fail, it will report that and say, here's where I found a failure. This was inspired by uh, some functional language testing frameworks like QuickCheck in Haskell, which are actually some of them much more elaborate. QuickCheck, for example, will actually try to find the smallest, for some definition of small, test case that causes your test to fail. Closure test generative isn't that elaborate yet, but that gives you an idea of where this could potentially go. Another thing you'll probably be hearing uh, quite a lot about at the Conj this year is Core Logic, written by David Nolan and uh, Ambrose and some other people. This is uh, essentially Prologue, or more specifically, it's a variant of Prologue called Mini Canron, and it allows you to do logic program the logic programming, to write your program as a series of statements of facts and then ask questions. Are these facts consistent? Is this fact true? Uh, I don't actually know how it works. It's on my list of things to learn, so I don't know what this example means. But <laughs> it's, I, I really do think uh, logic is the next step after functional programming. It is even more declarative, even more divorced from implementation um, and it's, it can be an extremely powerful technique, especially when you can combine it with the rest of Clojure as a, as a full programming language. So then there are all sorts of interesting areas of the JVM that you can explore. Uh, class loaders are black magic. Class loaders are actually what allows Clojure to compile source code into bytecode and load it into a JVM at runtime. They are both the mechanism to load bytecode into the JVM and the mechanism to control visibility of classes across the JVM. So any uh, Java application server or framework like JBoss or Tomcat, they're using class loader tricks to control which parts of the application can see each other. Like I said, it's definitely black magic, um, but I believe there's a lot of interesting work to be done with class loaders in the context of a dynamic language like Clojure. Most of the class loader stuff from the Java world, stuff like OSGI, is all tied to an idea of a static compilation cycle. Uh, dealing with dynamic languages introduces a whole other set of problems, and we're still trying to solve them with regard to building, deployment, and updating running code on a server environment. Next, the ASM library, ASM. This is in Clojure. This is an open source library that Clojure uses to generate Java bytecode. And Java bytecode is lots of fun because it's really small. There's only, I don't know, fewer than 200 byte codes, op codes, in JVM bytecode. And a lot of them are redundant. So you can learn the basics of JVM bytecode in a few hours and then start generating your own bytecode and do all kinds of tricks. You can do optimization, compilation tricks, all kinds of fun stuff by playing around with bytecode. JNI and JNA are Java native interface and Java native access. These are two different ways to get at native code, code written in C or any other object compiled language. Uh, JNA is supposedly slightly easier to work with. 
JNI does require you to write a little code in C in order to make it work, but I think it is actually uh, better in the long run. It is more slightly more efficient, and it gives you explicit control over what's happening at the boundary between the native code and your JVM code, such as Clojure. So uh, I used, in one project, JNI to interface with syslog, the basic system call for syslog. And that ended up being about 100 times faster and more reliable than the pure Java library to do the same thing that we had been using. And it was literally one function call that I had to implement. JSVC is uh, probably not very well known. It's an Apache project. Um, I think it stands for Java Service Container. And it's basically a combination of native and Java code that allows a Java program or any JVM language program to integrate properly with the Unix operating system, which of course is the only operating system that matters. It allows Java programs to do the things that Unix programs do and are good at, things like forking, uh, taking and dropping user privileges, execing to replace processes with other processes. It is a really useful thing if you are deploying JVM applications in a Unix environment. It makes your life so much easier. It's way better than shell scripts. Finally, I am going to end with a brief rant to just go out there and make stuff. Make applications, make libraries. Please do not make frameworks. I think Clojure, this is only the second Clojure conj. Clojure is much too young for us to know how to write frameworks yet. Frameworks arise out of experience with writing the same app over and over again. So go out there, make applications, find the common patterns, find what you have to repeat over and over again. Make it easier with libraries. And then once you've done that for three or four years, then we can have frameworks that actually tell us how to structure our code to make particular kinds of applications. That is all I have. I want to say thanks to Chris, Alan, Naoko, um, and Andrew, everyone else who helped make the conj possible this year. They've done a tremendous job. And thank you for coming, and enjoy the conch.